There's a blob of hot glue in there. You can see they've actually installed a GPU support, by which I mean they're using the USB 3.0 header to retain the video card. Here's the thing. They shipped the wrong, wrong products. There's a few ways to look at that. Pretty colossal f up by Walmart on that one. Pretty colossal f up. Well, we put in an order for another one of these almost a year later. Let's see if it's improved. Motherfuck! Before that, this video is brought to you by us and the GN Store. The best way to support our independent reporting is through store.gamersnexus.net. This is made possible with your purchases of merch like our GN Media Mod Mats in stock and shipping now and designed with GPU teardown diagrams and grids. Our 100% custom made two tone shirt is also a great way to help and it's currently on sale. The shirt uses 95% cotton and 5% elastin for a sporty fit with vibrant colors and was designed entirely by the GN team. Learn more at the link in the description below or go to store.gamersnexus.net. Walmart took a few hits when it first released this pre-built system, its first one, the DTW series, that it co-built with Esports Arena and another OEM that was never publicly named. We ended up doing some analysis on it. The first video was just kind of a disassembly build quality type of thing. And then we looked at the quality of the case and we did thermal analysis on it. Spoiler, it was bad, really bad. Uh, we also looked at the power supply, which was refreshingly not bad. So the power supply is made by Great Wall and despite its looks, it's very plain, it's gray, it's not got much for sleeving. It actually ended up being fine. In fact, it was better than some comparable power supplies by known manufacturers. That's because Great Wall manufactures a lot of power supplies, uh, many of them for Corsair. It's just got Corsair's name on it with Corsair's spec on top of it. So we looked at those things. We looked at the system originally, and what we bought was the DTW3. We bought and paid for the Walmart DTW3 originally, over $2,000 shipped, something like $2,200. What arrived was a DTW1. And so we bought another DTW1, uh, and unfortunately they didn't ship a DTW3 instead. But we did get the DTW1 properly. The reason for all of this is because a lot of you have messaged us over the last couple of months, probably the last four or five months now, saying Walmart has dropped its prices. And when we went and looked, this system used to cost $1,400 for the DTW1, which has a GTX 1070, an i7-8700 non-K CPU, and an H310 motherboard, and used to have one stick of RAM, talk about that more later, plus uh, the board's bad, the case is bad, and everything else is more or less just unexciting. So $1,400 for that assortment of hardware was completely insane, even a year ago before RTX and all that other, or right around when RTX came out, actually. It was just after. So now it's $900 for mostly the same parts, and it's at a point where the question is, is it worth buying just for parts and then scrapping the stuff that you don't want? So that's what we're looking at today in, in part. And we're also going to be looking at uh, build quality once again. You saw that boot media not found error. That was how it came out of the box. So basically the DTW1 came in, this thing, like in the last week or so, 2019, it was end of August when it came in and gave it to Patrick, told him to set it up for testing. And as soon as it, the power button was pressed, this is a pre-built system to remind you. It has one job, which is to be like pre-built so that the user doesn't have to do anything. Hit the power button that goes to boot media not found. Have we learned nothing? <laughs> like this is some of the complaints the first time were that the power cables weren't plugged in to the video card. And then some of our complaints were uh, seemingly now minor, like 
glue, for example, or just bad performance or, you know, shipping completely the wrong part, it's completely the wrong computer while charging the same amount of money. Now, they did replace it, but that shouldn't happen. And our concern then was, will everyone notice? Because uh, we actually didn't until we started testing originally. This was a year ago. And so the thermals were way lower than they should have been because the parts were wrong. But now, uh, system doesn't turn on. And the reason why it's fixable uh, is that in BIOS, so there's two drives. There's a secondary drive, and it is a, still a Toshiba drive. Secondary drive, there's a primary 256 gigabyte SSD, and the boot order was set to boot to the secondary drive, which has nothing on it. It's a blank drive. It's meant for your games, your pictures, whatever. And that was the boot drive. So how, how that gets past QC tells us that there is no QC, or at least was no QC, because the manufacturer date on this is November of 2018, which is one month after the manufacture date of our original system, which means that these things are sitting in a warehouse. So, uh, well, I guess everyone listened to us. But the fact that they're sitting around, haven't been QC'd since, even after all the very public and definitely seen by Walmart complaints, is disconcerting. Ultimately, other than scavenger enthusiasts looking for parts, this system is still most likely to be sold to consumers who know very little about computer maintenance, if anything at all. The target audience is probably parents of kids who want to buy a system for their kid to play Fortnite. So they go to Walmart to buy a, quote, gaming PC, and they end up with this. We were really disappointed to see that, you know, the first time Walmart shipped us the wrong computer, other people had public issues with power cables, and then we get a boot media not found screen. And remember that most people in the Walmart audience, they don't know what BIOS is, let alone how to enter it and use it. This machine would very likely have been an RMA unit. Most people who buy this, you plug it in, you turn it on, it doesn't work. It goes to boot media not found. What the heck does that mean? They drive to Walmart, they bring it back. That's how this would have gone if it went to a customer. Uh, it's still gonna go back and it's gonna go back for that reason. But we were able to fix it for the period of time we needed to fix it for. So yeah, that's the issue. Uh, same flaws as before. No growth, no QC in the year since, no going back through old inventory and fixing problems for the most part. Overall, the system does work. It just needs to be configured properly. Uh, it's also changed from last time in one key way. So let's take a look. The biggest difference between this and the original one we ordered, they're both DTW1s, they're built around the same time, but for whatever reason, this one's got two sticks of RAM, the original had one. And the only reason that's significant is because we move to <laughs> being able to use both channels that the CPU presents, even though it's still on an HD10 motherboard. But uh, So that was a big change, not quite sure when or why Walmart made that change. We will note that the this system, purchased in August of 2019, is uh, serial numbered as 425, and the original one was marked as 14. So assuming the serial number is incremental, this unit is, uh, it's been sitting around for a while. There's still glue, by the way. This is that, that would actually rip the socket out, I think, if I, I think if I wanted to rip on this for comic effect of hearing the noise when the glue snaps, but I'm pretty sure it's glued hard enough that it'll actually just rip the socket out of the board. So if we want to, if we want to move that, we'll use a razor blade. That's still glued. But anyway, it's either been sitting in a, a warehouse for like a year or maybe it was RMA or whatever, but the, the thing we're confused about is that there's a one month gap between these builds, but the dual stick memory configuration here is, uh, although in the newer unit, it's, it's not quite new enough that we think Walmart would have completely changed everything. So maybe they were randomly assigning memory kits and it was just a matter of allocation. Maybe it was an actual improvement, don't know. This is also an improvement, so they've, got sleeves on the cables now. Maybe Kyle complains too much about ketchup and mustard, uh, as one does when you're Kyle. And so, Kyle, if you're watching, this this sleeving thing, that might be from you. That, uh, well, they're individually wrapped. They actually bought a wrap 
to put on the cables, which that's an extra step. So that's a uh, two sticks of RAM and then sleeving one month manufacture date difference, about 400 unit differences, more changes than we expected. Still really surprised if the serial numbers are actually sequential, really surprised that this is 425, so they didn't make that many. And then we're just now getting it. Back to the memory though. So this stuff is really bad. It's actually a uh, Walmart on their website calls this a 2440 megahertz kit, which that's not a thing that exists. It's a 2400 megahertz kit. The 40 megahertz is not significant in any way, the extra 40 megahertz, except for demonstrating that uh, Walmart is is not good at this, and that doesn't instill faith, obviously, in its ability to build a good computer. The timings auto configured to 1717, 1739, which are horrible, obscenely bad for 2400 megahertz. That, that should be really pretty tight timings. So that's what it auto configures to. There's actually no XMP on this. Uh, the profiles are not present. And so instead, it's just the motherboard's responsible for auto configuring. As far as the motherboard underneath all of this, so the board is actually an H310 motherboard. And the interesting thing with H310, let's see if they glued the video card into the PCIe slot, like iWay Power used to do many years ago. Instead of the something like an H370, which is not that much more expensive, H310 actually uh, runs a DMI. Oh, oh, that's right. They've, they've, I forgot. I had forgotten. They cable manage, and they they secure the video card by using the USB 3 cable <laughs> to secure it in place. Okay. All right. We've. Well, some things don't change. But yeah, the downside. H310 has a it, transacting via DMI. For the chipset, the bus speed is only five giga transfers per second, whereas H370 uses DMI3, not DMI2, like this does, and that is eight giga transfers per second from five. So you've got almost a halving of the chipset to CPU bus speed. So the CPU under the heatsink to the chipset is communicating at uh, a little bit better than half the speed of every other motherboard in this generation, except for these low end H310 boards. And that's just not ideal for anything I.O. heavy, which this probably will never be. But uh, other changes, the maximum PCIe generation for this chipset, H310, is 2.0, not 3.0. And it's actually limited to just six PCIe lanes. Before anyone freaks out, keep in mind that the CPU has its own PCIe lanes for graphics. Those are going here to this graphics slot. It's going to be 16 of those. So it's, it's not the same as having six from, the, like, the chipset doesn't power graphics here. But six is still pretty bad. It's less to allocate to other devices, which is why you see so few here. And uh, it'd be also be 20 lanes for reference on H370 versus the six on this one. As far as the cooler, it's the same thing as before. It's this small 92 mil cooler. The uh, system, when you turn it on, actually doesn't have, the, have up to date drivers. So this card is an NVIDIA card and uh, the drivers on it are from about a year ago. The reason that we find this concerning, even though the manufacture date is marked as November versus our original October manufacture date, we'd still like to see drivers updated before the system goes out. Iowa Power, Cyber Power, a lot of companies like that will do a, a final QC pass before something goes out, and it's not happening here. So what you end up with is drivers for things that are old, which is a potential security problem, which means that also, separately, if you're running drivers from a year ago on this, you buy it today, and your kid or you or whoever wants to play the newest games on it, you're not going to have game-ready drivers, and worst case, it doesn't work at all. Best case is it runs very poorly. Uh, separately from that, microcode for the CPU under all this, the 8700 non-K. We check the thermal paste spread, too. I think it was actually OK last time. I don't remember, but the microcode um, is going to be a year out of date also. And uh, with all the security updates in the last year, that's suboptimal, obviously. OK. So bad QC practices. And the tools I'm using today are from our toolkit. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you want to pick up the toolkit. It's got everything you need to take apart most video cards. But I mean, if you're doing something like this, this is you just need the Phillips head from it. This is not difficult. 
still really confused about how this was sitting in the warehouse for apparently about a year. I guess bad sales or maybe they didn't sell them sequentially and this one came back or something later. Or uh, another thing too is we've noticed that the DTW3 hasn't been restocked for months. So I don't think they're actively making them. It's probably old inventory, which means these things were a, an exceptional failure if, if they're still sitting around. Also, only 400 units uh, between our two serial numbers, which if they're sequential and they seem to be, would also be really bad by Walmart's standards. Thermal pace seems fine, honestly. No problem with that. Let's go through some numbers just to see if uh, Patrick ran some tests on this, see if any of the parts are worth it as the build versus standalone. Thermals, the case is unchanged from the DTW1 that we previously reviewed. We reviewed that case standalone and we reviewed the power supply standalone. You can check those out individually if you want to see them. We'll pop the one of the charts up on the screen briefly with the DTW1 thermals versus our standardized case bench for hard numbers that can be compared against other cases on the market. The short version is that it was actually the worst case on the bench thermally ever. So that's, that's the short version. With the DTW1, all we had left to do now was find out how hot it runs with the included hardware rather than the higher end hardware. So before we were testing to see is the case able to sustain a DTW3 or something, but now looking at as is. We ran a 30 minute loop of Fire Strike Extreme stress test to simulate a gaming workload, which resulted in an average CPU temperature of 23.1 degrees Celsius over ambient, delta T over ambient, and a GPU delta T over ambient of 44 degrees Celsius. Again, for a comparison to other cases we've tested, check our previous review of the Walmart case. It's bad uh, when considering a standard testing system averaged 42.6 C delta T over ambient and 59.3 C GPU delta T over ambient in the same test. The DTW1 as is gets pretty warm, but at least the lower end components generate enough uh, less heat and it copes better with the case and the CPU cooler than the higher end components in a DTW2 or 3 would do. We allowed the CPU and the GPU to control their own fan speeds this time. We typically control all that stuff, but we tested it as a user would. GPU fan speeds peaked at about 1900 RPM to maintain a GPU diode temperature reading of 68 degrees Celsius, and the tiny CPU fan at about 1700 RPM to maintain a CPU package temperature around 50 degrees Celsius. This is not a CPU stress test by any means, and the CPU would be much hotter if it were. For game testing, we ran some of our usual CPU test subjects at 1080p. These results can't really be compared to anything but our CPU reviews are a good indicator of what scores could be achieved in these tests with a better motherboard, memory, <laughs> GPU, SSD, cooler, everything else. Any comparisons here are, are really just for fun. Civ is a little more fair than the other games to compare the previous results since turn time shouldn't be impacted by the GPU. It is definitely impacted by memory speed though. 35.3 seconds average turn time is just slightly slower than the 35 second average we recorded for the stock R5 3600X, but it does lag well behind the 32.6 second average that the 8700K stock scored on our bench thanks to the lower frequency and performance limitations from the other hardware of the system like the motherboard and the memory. We have two more here to quickly go through. We won't bother trying to match the DTW1 against our test system for Total War Warhammer 2 battle benchmark, but uh, it's already limited by the GTX 1070 anyway. But on its own, this test shows absolutely playable performance at 1080p high settings with even the 0.1% low staying comfortably above the 60 FPS threshold at 71.5 FPS average. The campaign benchmark is slightly more suitable for comparison to other CPU tests since there's not nearly as much GPU load. The k skew does have a higher base and turbo clock, but most of that gap is due to other hardware in the system, memory and GPU, for example. And as with the battle benchmark, that's more than adequate performance for playing Total Warhammer at 1080p. And finally, for an example of a game that performs miserably on the DTW1, we can turn to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which really likes memory, and this doesn't have good that. <laughs> This averaged 53.5 FPS, even though we just used medium settings at 1080p. This is also the most GPU limited benchmark that we currently have in our CPU testing lineup, and that shows up when you're stepping down from a 2080 Ti. The title reacted most negatively to certain memory kits in our recent Ryzen 3000 memory, so we know that it's memory sensitive as well and potentially doesn't like the 2400 megahertz RAM with no XMP on it at all. Whether the DTW1 is a bargain or not, it's not good for much more than 1080p gaming, and it's clearly not a forward-looking purchase when one of the newest games in our testing lineup can't be run at 60 FPS. 
Also, you could buy a better pre-built system from almost anyone else. So has Walmart fixed it? No. Is it worth it? Uh, not really. But the biggest problem we have is, again, that even with everything Walmart should have learned, with old inventory even sitting in the warehouse, someone should have gone through it all and done the basic, is PCIe plugged in? Is ATX plugged in? Is EPS 12 volt plugged in? When I push the power button, does it go into Windows? Because going to a black screen with text that says boot media not found, press any key to try again, doesn't count as working. That's bad. So Walmart hasn't really improved here. It's had the time to go through and fix these things. But frankly, and we all know this, Walmart's a big enough company that for the most part, probably people higher up in the chain who make these decisions looked at the product and said, let's cut our losses. It's not worth it. Put it on sale, slash the prices, get rid of it, and we won't look back. Rather than saying, let's fix this and regain some confidence of customers. We gave this, like, like, we thought we'd be buying this thing and it would be improved in a lot of ways. They've done some things. There's sleeves on the cables now. The most important possible change you could make, apparently. But there's still, it's just, it's like every time. Every time this thing shipped out, if you thought us getting the wrong system was a one-off bad problem, you can then look at, say, Kyle's review or Linus's review. Even Linus started his review saying, you know, I thought people were being more down on this and we would be able to put a positive spin on it. But then he had basic problems too. So it's like, no matter what, there was always something really critical to the system being able to turn on that was wrong. And that remains true here where everything's right except for boot media. So now it's like two critical errors, two out of two attempts, 100% miss rate for Walmart with us, um, which is unfortunate because I, I honestly, kind of like Linus a year ago when he was doing this, honestly thought this might be more of a comeback story where we'd be saying, wow, $900, that's a pretty big price slash. Yeah, it's actually worth it, except that's not, it's not true because if the basic user can't turn it on, that's bad. And then if you're an experienced system builder, obviously you're always going to have the advantage of DIY, which isn't really a fair comparison. Let's do some comparison, though. 8700 these days, uh, you can get a 9700 for about $330. That put you as similar in a lot of ways, better in some ways. Uh, but 9700 would be $330. The memory can't find it online, it's too bad, like as in it's, it's not good enough to really be listed anywhere retail. So you get some cheaper memory that's better than this. Uh, Gigabyte GTX 1070, you could buy maybe say like a 1660 Ti for like 300 bucks or something. Two sticks of eight gigabytes of memory, 2400 megahertz even would be $60. You could get a 256 gigabyte SSD like this one for about $35, roughly the same thing. Two terabyte hard drive would be about $40. ATX case, call it, call it 40, it'd be better than this. And uh, then, uh, although you wouldn't have glass and LEDs, but it would like work, so that'd be good. Uh, motherboard, no more than a hundred bucks for sure for this kind of build if you're trying to match it. So DIY, you're probably at like 900, 905 dollars tops. And so the the answer then is it worth buying for parts? Is basically no. It, it'd have to come down a little more if you wanted to buy it for parts and then like build something with those parts, resell it, and get rid of the motherboard in the case. So the takeaway here is if you can't DIY, you don't want to, that's completely valid. A lot of people don't want to, don't know how, don't have any interest to learn, whatever it may be, uh, or just can't, then yeah, go for buying a pre-built system. That's totally fine. There's a lot of companies though that have a lot more experience and do it better. And companies that are new are great. We, it's always good to see new companies come into the space. But normally when a new company steps in, it's got the sort of like the passion of a real enthusiast behind it who says, I think everyone else is doing X, Y, and Z worse than I can do it. And so I'm gonna prove to everyone that I can do it better with less staff. This is the opposite. Massive corporation that is just untouchable in terms of uh, revenue and size by any system integrator except the likes of the big ones like Dell and HP. But CyberPower, IoPower, none of, they, they can't touch Walmart. In fact, they sell at Walmart, a lot of them. So Walmart comes in, established, well-known brand, trips over itself, <laughs> drops the system, 
shatters everywhere and then picks it up and sells it to you. So that's that's Walmart's approach. It's a very unfortunate because they have the resources to do this well and scare everyone. But if you want to buy one, look at some of the other brands. And uh, even if it's a non-gaming focused brand like Dell or HP or any of the kind of boring ones that have been around for ages, it's probably going to be better on average than this. But there's plenty of enthusiast brands out there too. So uh, I guess we'll shout out NZXT, BLD is kind of new. You got CyberPower, IOPower. All of these companies have some problems too. You can research it on your own, but uh, on the whole, they're better than what's offered here. That's it for this one. Wasn't what we were expecting, but um, it is going back though. And the reason is I can't figure out how to turn it on. It doesn't work. And then that'll be the end of the saga. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more so you can catch some of our other videos coming up. We have a lot of reviews in the pipeline, some news videos, stuff like that. If you aren't familiar with the content, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to buy some of our stuff like the toolkits or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.